when we went back to the um, power and politics and security section, what's the other issue with this and Facebook? If Facebook has this much power over what information you get, uh, what is possible to do via Facebook? What did happen in the last election? Yeah, um, if, if, you, if they control, if they have the, the information, then that means it's also accessible to somebody that, you know, isn't supposed to be given. Yeah. Um, so, you, what ends up being the case is Facebook has a thing where you're allowed to basically post anything on your Facebook which doesn't violate certain very general rules. You're not allowed to post like videos of people being harmed. Like you're not like beheading videos are not allowed. You're not allowed to post videos, and this was an issue because early on in um, when Islamic State was taking off a few years ago, they were using Facebook to post beheading videos. Um, yeah, that was like one of the main ways they advertised them. It's like we have a prisoner, we're chopping off the head. It's now on Facebook, and so Facebook had to institute policies to stop these sorts of things, and various other sorts of issues are in place. Um, and part of the, so like there are other things like you're not allowed to post child um, pornography, obviously. You're not allowed to ch post like abuse videos. Anything like that is not allowed. But other sorts of things which you might think are problematic are allowed. So things like, you know, you can make cert like certain sorts of racist comments are allowed as long as it's within like certain limitations. You can't say we need to kill all people of blank race, but you are allowed to say like, my belief is that people of this race are less smart than people of that race, which is why blah, 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 blah. Uh, and you don't need to back it up. So because of this, and this, this is tied in with something we said, um, or I guess this is tied in with catfishing, which is basically because of this, you don't have to be an actual person to, cre to create a Facebook page as if you were that person. And because of this, you can post just about anything you want and say anything about yourself um, on the internet. And because of this, what can happen is people who aren't really real people can start influencing what sorts of news gets onto Facebook, what sorts of people are able to get information, what information is given to them. So this is what happened with the, and also use Facebook as a platform for organizing and sharing stories. Because another thing that'll often happen is if you're somebody who's constantly been like going to to InfoWars over and over again, then Facebook is also going to know to show you the posts of your friends who also go to InfoWars all the time, because it's going to know that those are the people who you're probably going to be more interested in interacting with. So if you like InfoWars and somebody else in your friend group likes InfoWars, it's going to send you to that person, whether or not that person actually exists. And so what was the worry about this? What happened in the election? We mentioned this a little bit uh, probably a couple months ago at this point. Who was involved in Russia. Russian trolls? There is an yeah. organization of Russian trolls who basically during the election set up tons of fake Facebook accounts and what they ended up doing was sending news articles to certain parts of the country designed to sway people's opinions. And what effect they had on the election, no one knows. Like, would Trump have been elected if this hadn't happened? Quite possibly, you know, he, it, even though he lost the popular vote in the important states, he won pretty clearly. But there are worries of like people in certain areas uh, were getting it, news stories that were designed to change their views in a way that supported Trump over Hillary Clinton. And the goal was not to like, it was just to like cause chaos in the voting process. It started, the goal was to get people on one side to think the people on the other side were crazier than they were, and to get everyone extra polarized and hating each other more and more. And so what you ended up happening was you had pe fake users create, like posting fake, like it's not hard to write a news article that looks like it's news article, but it's really, and not fake news in the sense of what Trump says when he doesn't like uh, CNN. I mean in the sense of like, the person writing the article knows it's false and posts it anyway. So things like Hillary Clinton is running a child prostitution ring out of a pizza shop, or Barack Obama isn't really American, he has terrorist connections. Those sorts of things where the person writing the news story knows it's false, but if you put the right heading on it and you post it to Facebook, then Facebook's not gonna know it's fake and it's gonna send it to people who are likely to click on it. And in this way, a Russian troll whose goal is to get people who are thinking about voting to Hillary, for Hillary Clinton to be less likely for it,
can start being getting those news stories filtered. Or you can just have people with these, like, you can have people who just start liking pages. So if you get 100 people to like some fake news story, then that fake news story, they see it and they're like, oh, 100 people liked this. Must be a good story. I'll click on it. And that's the way in which you don't even need to have actual people to affect the views of Americans. And this is the way in which, like, the way we get to, for democracy to work, you have to have informed people. But how you get informed has changed, and because of this also, how you get misinformed has changed. I think it's also interesting, though, when like, you think, like, I don't know how many people have been using social media for a long period of time, because you might not know. But if you only came to, like, social media recently, then you really wouldn't know. But, like, over time, you're starting to see how they develop the new ways of monitoring these type of, like, instances, like, you know, because at first it was just about your general information, like, who are you, what you like, but then it started to be about, like, your status, like, what's your status for today? And then it was about your mood for today. Then it was about trending topic. And then now it's about, you know. And this was, and the other thing is, think about what how Facebook works. It's designed to get information about people and advertise to them. So stored in Facebook is tons and tons and tons of data about you. So it's, it's basically, Facebook is a data miner's paradise. Because think about all the things that are correlated to what you do on Facebook. Things like what you like gives you views about your political uh, views. What you um, like you, gives you views you on your social views. Where you are. Where you are. It, it knows where you are because what Wi-Fi you're connected to or where your cell signal is or where you're logging in from. So it'll know not just uh, who or what you're interested in, but where you are when you're interested in those things. So it might know generally like, if, without you saying where your residence is, Facebook can know where you live or what state you're a voter in pretty quickly. Or things like um, what, who your friends are. Because if you're like, in yeah, my point about that though, because if you're like a person that's using Facebook and you have all these views about stuff but you're from the Bronx and you're, and then you're somebody who has all these same viewpoints but you're like in like Australia, they're going to really take that into consideration about the type of person that you are. Yeah, and that's the fact that you can find out, it's not just that you can find out where someone lives, you might also be able to find out where people were from originally, because if you see somebody who posts, like, there are certain words which people only use in New York City. Um, classic example is, um, so, there's a queue of people, I'm using the British term to, to explain this. Imagine there's a, there, up there is a counter and we're going to buy something. And in the way, there is one, two, three, four, five. I'm the sixth person waiting to do this. Describe what is currently true of me. What am I? In line. Am I in line or am I online? Online. Or at the end of the line. So here's the thing. It's changed a little bit generationally. You're online. But in New York City and about 50 miles in every direction, people say online. Everywhere else in the country, people say inline. If you hear somebody saying, I'm standing online, you know that either they or a close family member is from New York City. So if you, if Facebook realizes this, you can find out pretty quickly, like, oh, this person is from New York originally. They might be a New York voter. They might, it just from po like posting, like, I was standing online today at the mall, and like that right there, that's a sign they're from New York. Or another sign, um, you can find out, uh, like there's tons of these little linguistic quirks or like bigger picture ones is like what sports teams you like or like w how you talk about things or these sorts of things are there in the Facebook data. So if anyone gets their hands on that and can mine it, you can get so much information, which is what the Cambridge Analytica data mining scandal was. This was a company who was collecting user data through Facebook and using it to create voter profiles on who was likely to vote different ways in the election. They were hired by, they were basically, they were working through a complex connection with the Trump campaign using Facebook data to identify who was, uh, like basically any sort of information. So other things which you can identify through Facebook, it's not just a matter of what someone's views are, you can pretty accurately identify who is likely to change their friends' opinions. So you have friends who if they say something, you just laugh. 
Like, they may be one of your best friends, but you don't take their opinions seriously. They're kind of a goofball, they're a class clown. You have other friends, though, where when they say something, you believe them. And based on information like this, you can start to identify who are the people who really matter. Because if you're an advertiser, if you can identify the one person who's likely to change their whole friend group, you only have to spend, say you've got one person, and whatever that one person does, 10 people follow them. If you can change that one person's opinion, then you only have to spend one-tenth of the money to change 10 people's opinion. And that's the sort of thing that Facebook could also, or Cambridge Analytica could also identify. It's like, who are the people whose opinions matter? Think that, how many of you have seen, uh, this is a somewhat dated reference, how many of you have seen um, like Mean Girls or any of those like teen movies where there's like the cool really list. cool kid or the cool girl who whatever that person does, everyone else follows them? Oh, Think of yeah. it like that. Like what, basically, without having any idea, it, like you could, without watching, you can imagine what Facebook could do is without watching uh, Mean Girls, just looking at, like, one person will post something on their Instagram, and then a week later, all that person's followers will. You can identify without knowing anything about them. Oh, this is an influencer. This is who we have to identify. This is whose person we have to change. So in that movie, whatever the, the cool girl's name was, if you could get her to wear something, you know the whole school's wearing it afterwards. And in this way, if you could get her to vote for Donald Trump, everyone else will vote for Donald Trump as well, who she's connected to. And that's the sort of information you can gain from data mining. And the influence. way you do it if you just look at like temporal things like you see that this person's face or this person's influ um, Instagram has a hundred thousand followers and more importantly when they use a certain hashtag on a Wednesday by the following Wednesday 10,000 of their followers are also using that hashtag that way you know that person's an influencer somebody else might have 200,000 followers but whenever they post something nobody else follows no one's followed. They might have a lot of views, but they aren't an influencer. And that's the way you can identify things. And that's the sort of stuff you can identify and affect people's views. So, you know, in a political sense, if you know this person's the person who gets their friends to vote like they do, then all you gotta do is get that data out of the Facebook. And that's another thing, is because of big data, you can do these sorts of big things. You don't need Facebook. You can probably get information off of uh, things like public records. Like, if I know what like voting district you live in, and I know your income level, I might be able to find other sorts of things. And so these are the ways in which, like, how you go about running a campaign, and what sorts of things affect the campaign, and how people in other nations can affect voting patterns, it's just been fundamentally changed by technology. And then there's another one, which is just, like, the very voting and counting process is different. Um, that's another way for better or worse in which technology has changed. So, I last year, when I voted in the, um, the, uh, um, no, that was the Senate and House elections, uh, I was online, I was online, you can tell where I live, I was online for an hour and a half. Does anyone know why I was online for an hour and a half? Because you were bored. I was not. I mean, I was bored, but that's not why I was online. <laughs> This is a, like a, a strange roundabout way in, techno in which technology is involved. How does how many of you have voted oh, New York? Maybe because you have to wait for your number to be called. Not a number called. I was literally on a line, and it was just like I signed in, and they were like, "Go stand there." <laughs> um, does, how many of you have voted in New York State? Uh, describe the voting process. Just somebody shout it out. Go to ballot. Yeah, you go you go in and you check in, and they say, "Yeah, you're you," and they give you a ballot, and then what do you do? You w so you wait, you fill out your bubbles, and then you go to the machine. And what does the machine do? The it just scans it. It scans the ballot. That's all it does. It literally scans the ballot. Why do we have these machines? What are? Why do we use them? To save the data. They save the data, and what? how did it used to work? How did they used to count votes in the United States of America? Physically. Who, like physically, and physically counting them, who was doing it, what were they doing? It literally used to be back in the day you'd have people sit down and count pieces of paper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the machines were designed to get rid of some of those issues. However, the reason that I was online for an hour and a half turns out that the machines do not do well if the ballots are not perfectly dry. What happens if a ballot is not perfectly dry? It jams the machine. Mm -hmm. And because the machines are designed to be, uh, not be tampered with, you cannot simply open a machine and unjam it like you would a printer. You need a professional technician associated with the uh, 
New York Board of Elections to come, open your machine, unjam it, and put the ballots back in. When might ballots get wet? On a rainy day. On a rainy, rainy day. day. It was rainy. Everyone's coats were wet. People had umbrellas. Our hands were wet. Our ballots got wet. There were eight machines lined up. By the time I left, all eight of them were broken. And they had to just put them into a box and told us, we'll count them later once the machines are up. This is a way in which the literal physical cyber technology has changed. So on the one hand, it is now much quicker to count votes. And there are a lot of ways in which the systems are better. However, there are other ways in which, like all technology, which isn't perfect, it can run into physical problems. There was another issue with a Senate race um, in which the touch screens weren't correctly calibrated. Mm -hmm. So what's the key to a touch screen? Like if this says Democrat and this says Republican, what's going to happen? Where do you press on your touch screen where to vote? If I want to vote for the Democrat, where do I push? A Democrat. Yeah, I push there. What happens if the screen's not calibrated right? How many of you have ever gone to one of those eight, or one of the, the swipey at Metro card machines and you press here and for some reason it clicks down here? Yeah. When it's a Metro card machine, it's a pain in the ass and it wastes your time, but you can go to a different one. If you're voting, this is a bigger deal, especially because what often happened is it didn't even tell you that you'd click on the wrong one. It, because people, you know, board of elections are not the most wealthy parts of a, of a state, uh, very often it would just be like, you click in and take you a thank you for your vote page. So you click here, you think you voted for the Democrat, it's miscalibrated, you voted for the Republican. And, you know Donald Trump the president. and so <laughs> this is the sort of thing where like, whether that, like these things probably have not had a huge like impact on the presidential election. They may have, I don't know the logistics, but the issue is like, you can have people voting for the wrong person because the technology is not calibrated right. And God forbid, uh, so how many of you wrote your paper on the MTI uh, prompt? What was one of the major worries which just about all of you brought up for the problems with MTI? What could happen to the database? Uh, it could be hacked. In theory, any technology is hackable. Now they've done a lot of things and there's no evidence that the US uh, like election board system is actually hackable, partly because it's so old fashioned that it's really hard to actually hack it. And like none of the, like, the best way to hack into it is like a, like a really super fast, super connected network. You break in one point and you have access to the whole thing. But the voting network is so old fashioned that if you break into one machine, it doesn't give you access to any of the others. So it's not, there's no evidence that anyone is going to hack in or it would even be useful. But at the very least, it's in principle possible for somebody to hack into the voting system. Also, not just like if they institute that, like not just today or tomorrow, but like you don't know what's gonna happen in five years when there's A, more data in, in the system and B, new technology. Yeah, and so as of right now, like there's been no sign that elections have been rigged electronically or affected by somebody. But it's at the very least, like it's now a technological possibility. Like back in the day, when you literally took a little thing and you punched a hole in a piece of paper, there's no way, and then a human being counted it, there's no way to hack into a human's head and change the number of votes. You could get a very dishonest person to lie and say they got a number which they didn't actually get, but you couldn't get everybody to lie all at once. Nowadays, though, in theory, you possibly could. Um, now, whether, again, whether that ever gets to the point, it's not, no sign that that's coming, but you never know, and that's another issue. It's just the logistics, the physical technology. Technology is interwoven into the democracy a lot more intimately. Like, the, um, did anyone vote in the election uh, at the start of the month? Oh. Um, there was an election at the start of the month where there was one thing that was noticeably different for me than the one before, which was that nowadays you sign in on an iPad. Um, so when you go in and you sign in, it's no longer on a physical piece of paper, you sign on a touch screen. That's a way in which technology is a part of the voting process now. And for better and worse, it's much simpler, it wastes less paper, um, it saves the trees, it's quicker, but on the More other, efficient. and also you can't lose the piece of paper, like once it's in the cloud, it's out there. Um, like there's always a worry of things being lost, but now it's, you know, it just gets saved. Um, so it's got the plus side, but also just the fact is that these things are changing. Um, so in terms of how democracy changed, uh, one, campaign finance has been fundamentally changed because the way we exchange money has changed. 
I mean, just like Venmo has revolutionized what it is to give friends money. Yeah. How many of you regularly regularly carry cash with you? I do, but I know that in like amongst people I know, I'm in the minority. Um, also, how people uh, in how campaigns influence you is fundamentally changed. How you learn about campaigns is fundamentally changed, and also how you get news about how to vote for candidates and who to vote for and what their views are and even what's true and what issues should matter to you is fundamentally changed. So all of this, like the fundamental nature of our democracy is changing because all the things which determine how we vote, who we vote for, how we decide to vote, how we give money to who we want to vote for, all of it is different. And whether it's good or bad, I don't have a view on it. There's good and there's bad. And I'm trying to stay neutral, but the fact is it's changing. And because of that, and because of the fact is that all of us are affected by what happens in our government, that is changing our lives as well in a lot of ways. Like, say what you will about Donald Trump as the president. He could not, like, I, I'm quite confident, he could not have been elected before a social media age in which he was constantly going viral. Like, if you think back to his campaign, he would say something, and then everybody would talk about him for another two days until he said something else. And like back in the day, he wouldn't have had a platform to say that sort of stuff, and that clearly influenced the election. Like there were, there have been people before with the same sort of like anti-immigrant message and like very uh, extreme views and very like say extreme things and then just like go with it. But because of the nature of the media and the online platforms, it changed how in America that sort of person can get their message out. But what about like Hitler? And so what we can find is, and so here's a major difference. In, in Germany in uh, the 1930s, like there were, and this is an example of, um, so one thing, there were historical major background differences between Germany in 1930 and the United States over our history. Things having to do with uh, Prussian militarism, having to do with uh, the Great Depression hit Germany much harder than it even hit in the United States. And so it did, it created a sort of, um, I guess a better way of putting it is it's always possible that somebody with extreme racially motivated views can come to power, but very uh, rarely does it happen until you reach a level of economic crisis that is beyond what we hit in the United States. So like, let's be clear, there is a major, in parts of the United States right now, there's major economic issues with jobs and things, especially in the Midwest, where factory jobs have just gone down like in numbers, and a lot of people who used to have steady jobs don't anymore. So that's part of the reason. But part of the reason why, Donald, the amazing thing about Donald Trump is that he was able to get to the position that he did without any sort of like military power. Like uh, Hitler was originally elected in his, um, his first position as chance, I think it was, I can never remember my, uh, he was elected to a, an elected position, but then to get from there to basically running the country, there was a military push. Um, and he basically killed a lot of other politicians. Um, but the fact is that Trump got to the position of power elected in a way that he didn't require the final like military push. And when Hitler was originally elected, it was like not as like the most powerful person in his country. It was then something which he basically seized for himself from this position, and part, but in a similar sort of way, in the same way that Trump's extreme views became more acceptable in an economically crisis time in Germany in the 19, like late 20s, early 30s, it was literally like the money had collapsed to such a point that people were using money for wallpaper because it was worth more as wallpaper than you could get to exchange it. Like yeah, the Deutsche Mark was literally being used to make paper wall. Like the economy collapsed, and in that sort of case, if you have somebody who comes along and says. I will make the economy run again, and it starts to run again, people will very often be like, and you know what, I'm just going to turn a blind eye to a lot of other things. And that's very often what happens, is people go like, economic things matter more to me right now, I'm willing to accept this person's racism, their sexism, their homophobia, because right now, I just need to feed my family. Which and is why we elected somebody that is like a businessman. Yes, and that's part of it, um, yeah. And this is the other thing, is uh, if you, if you want to find out whether or not Donald Trump was a successful businessman, you can. Clue, he wasn't. He wasn't uh, dead. Um, he, he basically uh, he got all of his money from his dad, and then he lost a lot of money. 
Um, but the fact is that the narrative is able to be there, and people recognize his face on television as the head of this, like, he's the guy who fires people, so he must have money and power. And then if you, have that, head, yeah, you have that in your head to you're begin fine. with, uh, if you have that in your head to begin with, and if people are telling you he's great and he's powerful, etc., then you're going to listen to them. All right, I am tired about talking about democracy. So, we are going to have a class vote right now. First, we're going to show off this camera. Yeah, exactly.